let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. We came as far as verse 12, and that's where we're going to pick up this morning. And so as you're turning there, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we're going to see this morning from Peter that it is that sure foundation that we can build our lives upon, that when the storms come, and they're coming, as Peter's going to warn us, false teachers as there were false prophets in the Old Testament, there'll be false teachers in the New Testament. And our defense against those falsehood is the Word of God. And so thus we need to study, to show ourselves approved, workmen who need not to be ashamed, who can rightly divide the Word of Truth. So just, again, speak to us this morning as we work our way through the rest of chapter 1 on into the warning about false teachers in the first few verses of chapter 2 this morning. And so, Lord, just, again, give us ears to hear what it is the Holy Spirit is saying through the Word of God to our hearts this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're a note-taker, be reminded of the fact, as you get your pad and pen out, that Peter and Paul, most scholarship believe, are imprisoned in Rome at this time. Uh, Nero has burned Rome down in, in 64 AD and has blamed the Christian. And so Christian persecution has been going on at a very violent rate for about three years. They've arrested Peter, they've arrested Paul, and as it were, they're writing their last will and testament, 2 Timothy and 2 Peter, from a prison. And both of them have told us that they know that their time of departure is at hand because the Lord has shown that to them. And so as they put pen to paper under the inspiration, as we're going to see this morning, of the Holy Spirit, they are reminding us, they're leaving something behind. They're trying to remind us of the things that are important, the things that are necessary in our lives that we would endure the hardship that's going to come. And we're living in a time not unfamiliar to what Paul and Peter would have lived in. Where you will be hated, the Bible says, in the last days of all nations, because you stand on the authority of God's word, and you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. That we believe that Jesus Christ was God come in human form. That he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin. That he lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death for our sins to remove the power and penalty of sin from us. And he rose again the third day. He's ascended to the Father. And we believe that salvation is a gift from God through faith by grace. That It's nothing we could have done. We're here this morning because God is merciful, not because you're good. I mean, we would say amen to that. You know, he, again, he tells us it's not because you were good. How many would say that you were, have, have you been good all your whole life? Anybody? How many would say that you've been a scoundrel for most of your life and Jesus rescued you? Yeah, that's right. Amen. So Peter is writing to us the same as Paul and reminding us. And it's interesting as Peter opens up, he reminds us of a couple things that are important. And we'll just look at that again this morning. He says, listen, you, you have been given by God, listen carefully, everything that you need that pertains to this life and living godly in this life because he has given to you his divine power. See, we're not religious, we're born again. And as Paul prays for the church at Ephesus, and there's two prayers contained in the book of Ephesians, and the first one of those prayers that Paul prays for that church is that God would show them, that God would reveal to them, that God would open their eyes and illuminate their minds to understand that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is now in you that are born again. So you have that strength. You, you have that deutimus. Not only do you have the deutimus, the power of Christ, his spirit living in you, but you've also been given the authority, the asusia of his name. And, and that's why he says things like, if you resist the devil... He must flee. At the mentioning of my name, demons tremble. So we've been given the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit because we're born again to live this life for Christ, and we've been given the authority of his name. So Peter reminds us of this divine power, and then he tells us we've been given exceeding precious, exceeding great and precious promises. Can you imagine this big old fisherman using the word precious? He uses it seven times in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. 
He talks about this precious faith. He talks about the precious blood, the precious promises, the precious name of Christ. These things are precious to us. If you sit alone and realize where God took you and where you're going, and it's all because of grace, is this faith not precious? But he talks about precious promises. And I said to you last week that there's 7,706. Somebody had a lot of time on their hands, and they actually counted them. I didn't do it. I read it in a commentary. But this commentator, and most people agree that there's 7,706 promises in the Old Testament, and there's uh, 1,104 in the New Testament, almost 9,000 promises given to you and me. And one of the great promises, whoever will come to me, I won't turn you away. And that if you come to me, that what Jesus Christ did on the Calvary's cross will be sufficient to make you holy, and your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. And not only that, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That I'll always be with you. There are promises given to the Christian that are precious. And then he puts the capstone on it as we look there in the first parts of chapter 1 by saying, not only do you have this divine power given to you through the Holy Spirit because you were regenerated and born again, not only do you have that power, not only do you have those promises, those precious promises, but you've been given a divine nature. You see, I, I have to look back and think back a long ways to realize how my life was under the old nature because it's been almost 50 years since I surrendered my life to Christ and He took over. And then there's sometimes I try to grab a hold of the steering wheel. Any of you have done that? And the car went into it a ditch and the angel showed up with the spiritual tow truck and drug your carcass out, got you back on the road again, got you repaired, got you moving. How many have been there? But we've been given a divine nature. And this new nature desires the things of God and not the things of the world. This new nature says, I want to live godly. The old nature says, I want to live in the flesh. That's why the Bible says we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away and all things have become brand new. We have put off the old man and we put on the new man and we're walking in newness of life. We have a different mind. We have a different heart. We have different desires. We have different aspirations. Literally, our citizenship doesn't belong here anymore. Paul reminds us of that when he writes to the church of Philippi when he says, listen, your citizenship already exists in heaven. To whence we look for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because when He comes, we get to go be with Him and we get a body like His and we're going home to our Father's house. So in the truest sense this morning, we're not Republicans or Democrats or Independents. Now, should we vote? Yes. You should exercise that right that people gave their lives to grant you and you should vote your conscience. And as we look around today, there's not a lot of choices. So you, you simply look who's pro-Israel, who's pro-life, who's pro-marriage between a man and a woman. That's pretty simple. Vote that way. And I hope I didn't just get kicked off of YouTube. That's not political, that's spiritual. And so we've been given this divine nature. Now I want you to notice this before we get into the rest of this chapter. Because some people think they've earned their salvation and then once they receive it, they think it's upon them to maintain it. And there are, there are Christian denominations that teach that. I don't teach that. I've had people come here and ask me, well, are you a Calvinist? I said, no, I'm not a Calvinist. Well, why aren't you a Calvinist? Because I don't believe God chooses some to be saved and some to be damned. I don't think God would be righteous if by no causation of my own, because Romans chapter 5 said I became a sinner because... I inherited that sin nature from Adam. How many inherited your sin nature from Adam? Did any of you in the womb decide before you came out that you were going to be a sinner? You just had this thought, I'm just going to come out a sinner. No, no, no. You, they, King David said you were conceived in sin and born in transgression. And you came out with a fallen nature, with a corrupt nature. And so we, 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 we were born into this by no causation of our own. And if Jesus did not give us a way out, then he could not send us to hell for something we didn't cause and he gave us no way out of. So I can't be a Calvinist. I think Calvinists, I think their doctrine is an assault, assault 
to the very nature and character, character of our God. It's offensive to me. And then I've said, well, if you're not a Calvinist, you must be an Arminius. No, I'm not an Arminius. I don't believe you can send away your salvation once you're truly born again. Because I believe what God began in you, he will finish. And I believe what the uterine brother of Jesus, Jude, said, now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless. Who's able? Not you. Amen? Can I get an amen on that one? That's why Peter said in his first epistle, we've been giving great and exceeding and precious promises. As he goes back to the first letter he writes, and he tells us that we have a living hope. That's our, one of the great promises he's given us. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, fades on a way, reserved in heaven for us. And then he adds us who are kept by the power of God. Now, you might bounce off the guardrails going down the strip, but you ain't getting over them. You're going to stay somewhere on the track because God has ordained that. And one day he will present you faultless. So what are we? We're biblicists. We study the Old Testament and New Testament. We search the scriptures. We're Bereans. And as we search the scriptures, we find out that we've been given this divine nature. It's a gift. That's why Jesus says, if you come to me, I won't turn you away. And then John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have age abiding life. It's a gift. Now what do you do with that gift? That's what he said last week. Now, now that you have this divine nature, add to it. You're not saved by adding to it. You've already been given this divine nature, the very power of God. You've been born again by the Spirit. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now we need to learn to walk like what he already made us to be. And he says, so add, add to your salvation. Add to that moral excellence. Add to your moral excellence knowledge. Epinosis, the understanding of God's word. Add to that knowledge self-control. Add to the self-control Endurance or patience, endurance. Add to that brotherly love and add to that brotherly kindness and add to that the agapeo love, that kind of unconditional love we should have for one another. Because he tells us if those things be in you, you'll never be barren or unfruitful in the work of the Lord. But a door shall be supplied you or ministered you into eternal life. And that's where we left off last week. And so he's referencing, and the reason why he had to go over that again, because when you come to the word wherefore there in, chap, uh, in chapter 1, verse 12, the wherefore connects us to those things that we studied last week. So we say in light of, when you see wherefore, it could really mean in light of, in light of the fact that you've been given divine power, in light of the fact that you've been given exceeding great and precious promises. In light of the fact that you are a partaker of his divine nature, having been born of the Spirit, having been regenerated by the Spirit, in light of the fact now that you're a new creature or new creation in Christ Jesus, in light of the fact that you're now trying to walk with him, he's going to finish out the rest of chapter 1 and start us up in chapter 2 and say, listen, there's the foundation now that you need to build your life upon. And it's not subjective, it's objective. You see, when I was in school, when Jeff and I were in school, we were taught to be objective. You look at the facts, and the facts speak for themselves. Objective. Today, kids are being taught, and that's why you need to join Plumb Line, they're being taught to be subjective. It's how I feel. It's my truth. Even though I was born a male with all of the male qualities and the chromosomes and all of that, I decide I don't feel like I want to be male so I can be a female and I'll go to the boxing uh, <laughs> Olympics and I will beat up on women because I think I'm a female. That's subjective. And now Peter's going to tell us that he had a subjective experience on the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw Christ glorified. Because in John's gospel, it says, some of you standing here today will not die until you see the Son of Man coming in his glory. 
Well, what was he talking about? Six days later, Peter and John were up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they saw Jesus in his glorified state. They heard the voice of the Father. They saw the law and the prophets, Elijah and Moses, they were conversing with Jesus about the gospel that he's going to bring. In fact, he doesn't record it here. Peter will remind us of it, but he doesn't record what Mark, his, uh, you know, his disciple recorded when he wrote Mark. Mark is actually, if you don't know this, is the gospel according to Peter. Mark became, you know, Peter's disciple, and he records the gospel as Peter shares it with him. But he said that on that Mount of Transfiguration, it's funny, that because Peter didn't know what to say, he said, it's good that we're here. And we only, we only have one record ever in the Bible of God telling somebody to shut up and listen to the Son. God the Father says, Peter, shut up. And hear what my Son has to say. And I think sometimes that's good advice. Sometimes... We just need to shut up. That's the song we sing. Word of God, speak. Sometimes your lips are moving too fast for your ears to work. I find it interesting. God gave you two ears and one mouth. And sometimes you just need to be still and know that he is God. To sit alone with him. As Jesus did, going up into the mountains, leaving the men and the ministry and the multitude to spend time with his father. I'm doing that again on Monday. I tried to do it a couple weeks ago because you know my practice. And I went someplace where my phone still worked and pastors got a hold of me and counseling sessions for hours with them and some of the people in their church. And I didn't get to rest. We need to find that place where we hear his voice. But Peter will say to us, because he know he's going to tell us in this, in this chapter, that, he, that he's going to put off. The word he's going to use for deceased is exodus. He said, I'm about to exit this tent and move into my permanent dwelling. You see, we Christians don't die. But before I do, I want to remind you of things that are important so that the wicked one won't deceive you. He won't deceive you. So he says this, wherefore... I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of the things, though you know them and though you be established in them in this present truth. You know, the, the first time I taught through the Bible, I, I can remember thinking at the end of that, okay, now what do I do? I've actually taught through the whole Bible. You know what the Lord said? Start over. Because I guarantee you, it took you like seven or eight years to do that. They didn't remember. And so you go back. I think we're on our seventh time. I tried to figure it out here on Sunday mornings going through the New Testament. Because the fact of the matter is, we don't remember very well, do we? Do we? You know, you don't have to look any further than your teenagers. Go clean your room. And pretty soon you see them wandering around out there in the living room or outside chasing birds or something. And you say, what did I tell you to do? What do you mean? I told you to go clean your room. Is your room clean? No. Then go clean your room. Because you have to remind them. And we are the same. We need to be reminded. You know, I've had people say, you know... I've heard that from you before. That's good. That's good. You know, when I was in college, they, they taught me that in, in, a, in this public speaking course and then later on in sermon preparation, that as you're going through the Bible, if there's something important, you have to mention it at least three times for it to connect with the human brain. You know, and we know that's true from the Bible because how many times did, did God have to deal with Peter? I mean, Peter's the man of three. And, and I think it's true here this morning. So he says, I'm not going to be in neglect to remind you of things, even though I know you already know them. We need to, Peter's saying we need to be reminded far more than we need to be taught sometimes. Yeah, I think it right as long as I am in this tent, this tabernacle, to stir up, to stir you up, to put you in remembrance of these things. The word for stir up there is, is, to, is to stimulate, to, to wake up, as it were, to to, to, it's, it's the idea in the Greek of stirring a fire up, 
of poking the coals to get the flame to go again. And, you know, years ago, my son and I were out in the desert, and we didn't realize there were no trees to get wood from, and so we wanted a campfire that night. So while I was getting everything ready for the evening dinner, he went and collected a bunch of these sagebrush. And so we kept burning it and burning it and burning until we got a, a bed of coals. And it took all, we had cleared a path right around our tent at that time. We tent camped to get enough of that sage for us to get a bed of coals to cook our meal. And after we cooked our meal, it was interesting because we stuck a stick in the fire and we just kind of stirred it up and it lit back up because we didn't realize the oil, that sagebrush is full of oil. And listen, we're full of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes that fire will die down and it needs to be stirred again. And Peter said, I will not neglect to stir you, to stir that up in you. Knowing, verse 14 says, that shortly I must put off this tent, even as the Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. You know, the Lord spoke both to Paul and Peter saying, okay, you've run your race, you finished your course, it's time to go home. And so both of them were warned of this so that they could leave us a record of the things that were most important, these two great apostles. So he says in verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my deceased, after my exodus, I'm not dying, I'm moving. After I leave this body, and pick up my spiritual body and go home. For to be absent, Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, absent from this body is to be in the presence of God. So Peter's saying, I know that my time of departure is at hand. I'm going to be exiting this body. I'm going home to my heavenly body. I'm going to my father's house. But I'm not going to be unfaithful nor neglect the fact that I want to leave you a record. And here we are 2,000 years later reading the record that Peter left, reading the record that Paul left and the other apostles. So important. As they put pen to paper under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they left us a record. Ten years ago, I was having lunch with a bunch of pastors, and they were all upset over this woke thing that was going on, and even in the Calvary chapels, and how there was a departing from the biblical faith, and people weren't teaching the Bible anymore, Old Testament and New Testament, not seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit anymore. And so there was just, you know, they, they were going around a room and thinking of new ways, or trying to think of new ways to bring the church back to common sense. And so they looked at me and said, what are you going to do? That's when the that whole emergent church thing was coming in and the whole woke thing was coming in and, and the challenging of the inspiration of God's word and the challenging was all the Bible, the true Bible. I mean, it's all the stupid stuff. And they looked at me because I, I wasn't upset. They said, well, you, aren't you upset about this? Of course I am. Of course I am. But we're warned of it. We, we're told in the last days, men would not endure sound doctrine. But with itching ears would turn their ears away unto mythos, unto fables. Paul told us that in the last days there would be a departure from the biblical faith and apostasy. Paul told us it would be perilous times because there would be seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. So I was sharing with these pastors, so what I intend to do is to write a doctrines class. Because I'm going to do what Peter did. I'm going to put pen to paper. And I'm going to leave behind a record of systematic theology, doctrine, who God is, theology. Some of you went through the course 10 years ago. It's being used around the world now to train indigenous pastors, theology, Christology, who Christ is, pneumonology, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, soteriology, how you're saved, ecclesiology, what your church is about, and eschatology, where the church is going. So I thought it necessary, like Peter, to put pen to paper. I'm not going to stand in the pulpit and argue with these people. The pulpit is not for that. The pulpit is for teaching God's people God's word. But I wrote a doctrines class because when I come to that time of my exodus, you can go to our website and you can study, and the notes are there to download for free. Solid, systematic doctrine. And this is what Peter's doing. I'm going to leave you a record so that when I'm gone, you will have something 
to stir up your remembrances. And so he says, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power, the glory, the asusia, the deity of Christ, and not only his deity, but his coming. And this is interesting because Paul's going to warn us, in, I mean, Peter's going to warn us in the last days, scoffers are going to come. And we're seeing it. It's amazing. Even within the Calvary Chapel movement, after Pastor Chuck went to be with the Lord, how this whole thing arose now that we don't study prophecy anymore. We don't study end times anymore. We're not, we're not pre-trib. I'm pre-trib. I believe Jesus promised to come and get me before he poured out his wrath upon this world. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I got people call me all the time because, you know, we do a lot of prophecy here. In fact, we're doing on the radio now our prophecy update from a number of years ago. And they'll call and say, well, who do you think the Antichrist is? I don't care who the Antichrist is. I will never know. We're going to see that in the text. We'll never know who he is. He can't even be revealed to. That which constrains is moved out of the way. And that's us. I'm not looking for Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And I think he's coming soon. And I want to stir, but if, listen, if he doesn't come in my lifetime, I want to leave you a record of solid Bible teaching. Can I get an amen? amen. This is what he's saying. Because he says, for we have not followed. This is not a fairy tale that we have put our faith in. Cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you both the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter also doesn't mention in this text that God had to wake them up. They were asleep. They woke up and Peter sees Jesus in his glorified state talking to the Father with Elijah and Moses there. What a, what a moment that must have been. What an experience that must have been. What an experience. Because I hear people today saying, I died and went to heaven and this is what it looks like. Don't you buy into any of that. That's an experience. And we can't judge whether it's true or not. Because it's subjective. But we can judge what this says. Because this is objective. So I only know one person had an out-of-body experience that came back and told us about it. The Apostle Paul. And these other people are trying to describe things. Paul said, I can't describe it. Well, why can't you describe it, Paul? Well, there's nothing to compare it to. Your eye has never seen anything like it. Your ear has never heard anything like it. In fact, in your wildest imaginations, in the deepest recesses, you've never even imagined anything like it. What God has prepared for those who love him is so beyond words, it would be a crime for me to try to describe it because we don't have words for it. And so he leaves it alone. But suffice it to say, to be absent from this body, you will be present with the Lord. And what God has prepared for you, mind-boggling. In fact, he would say things like the suffering of this present life, not worthy to be compared to what lies on the other side for us. Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place for you. And if I do, I will come again. We believe that Jesus will return for his church, for his bride, to take his bride home. And then seven years, that last 70-week vision of Daniel will take place called the seven-year tribulation period where God will be dealing with the wicked. And then we return with Christ, the Bible teaches clearly, to set up his millennial reign where he builds the temple that, that will last for a thousand years and we rule and reign with him. We are not of those that have lost our faith. We believe that Jesus is coming. We believe our job is to be prepared for that moment and prepare as many people as we can for that moment. No matter what the persecution is. And this is why Peter's writing. He's saying, listen, we've seen his glory. We saw it. And we understood about his coming. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 17, For he received of God the Father honor and glory when came such a voice to him from the excellency of glory, this is my beloved son 
and whom I am well pleased. Now, this is the second time that somebody has heard this voice and heard these same words from heaven. You remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to be baptized because he was going to fulfill the law for us. And part of that is we needed to be baptized. Not for salvation, but in association with our salvation. We're saying that we're dead to the old man, we're alive to Christ. It's a visual explanation to the people who don't know Jesus. What happened to you? And so as Jesus is coming, John points to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't cover it like the Old Testament and the sacrifice. This is the one who will take away the sin for anyone who puts their faith in him. There's the Lamb of God. And then John says, I'm not worthy to even loose the latches on your sandal that you should come to me for baptism. But that the law might be filled, Jesus was baptized. When he came out of the water... There was, as it were, a dove, like our dove, descending, which was a type of the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the dove here, because you'll never understand the cross without the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit descending upon the cross of Christ, upon the name of Jesus, because they work in concert. And they heard this voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. But what we don't see in the English is this, in whom I am already well pleased. Jesus hadn't preached a sermon, hadn't worked a miracle. But because he was God's son, God was already well pleased with him. Let me say to you this morning, the moment you got saved, the moment you were born of the Spirit, that very moment when you became a new creation in Christ Jesus, you have to understand that God looked at you, he looked at me, he looked at us. And he said, there is, is my child in whom I am already well pleased. Before you fought a battle, before you resisted sin, before you knew anything, had learned anything, before you had ever been used of him to do anything, because you're in Christ Jesus, the Father would say of you and me, you are my sons and daughters. And I'm already well pleased. Because you have now been a partaker of my divine power and my divine nature. And you are a possessor of my precious promises. And I see you as you shall be, not as you are. Aren't you glad for that? I like what Spurgeon said. He said, you know what? I'm not what I used to be. How many would say that? I'm not what I used to be. But how many would also say, I'm not what I should be either. But you're in process. You are growing, as Peter will end this epistle with, you are growing in grace. You are growing in knowledge. We are growing. We're not stagnant or nor stale. But the important point is, on that Mount of Transfiguration, Peter and the gang heard the Father say of the Son, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard it. We were with him in that mount. We were there at the Mount of Transfiguration. That was a wonderful experience. But notice what Peter does now. He's going to say that was subjective, but we have something that's far greater than subjective. We have something that's objective. We have the sure word of God. And so he moves on to say, we also have a more sure word of prophecy wherein we do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place unto the day dawns and the new star arises in our hearts. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned, be honest with you, about a lot of our Pentecostal brothers that are chasing experiences. They're looking for gold dust to fall out of the ceiling and just, I, I'm very concerned about that. Because I personally believe, and don't shut me off now, because I, 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 I believe that all the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. And I believe that we ought to move and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, because Paul would say, having been born of the Spirit, you should walk in the Spirit. Because if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I am one who's baptized in the Holy Spirit. But my life does not stand on the foundation of my experiences. My life stands on the sure foundation of God's word. In fact, we hear so much about rhema. 
I don't think you should ever say God spoke to you until you know the logos, the written word of God. Because God will never go beyond the written word of God. If it's in here, you can trust it. In fact, the authority I have in this church as your pastor is not my title. It's that I stand true to the Word of God. And the moment I depart from the Word of God, you should depart this church. And you don't believe it because I said it. You believe it because I read it from God's Word because it's an error. It's, well, let me read you from, from, from 2 Timothy. Um, very, very important. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read verses 14 on into chapter 4, verse 5. Timothy also knows his time of departure is at hand. He knows that it's winding down. The Lord has shown him that he also, in fact, you know, historians tell us that it was uh, June the 29th, AD 67, both of them were martyred on the same day. Peter taken to be crucified because he wasn't a Roman citizen. Paul taken to the Appian Way and was beheaded. They both left this life on the same day. So they're both writing with the same sense of urgency. And Paul would say, but continue. He's telling Timothy, I'm leaving. I'm passing the baton on to you. You will now be in charge of the churches that we planted. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus, because all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. In the Greek, it says, all graphy, God breathed. All writing, God breathed. So God doesn't even put the authority of His Word on the people who wrote it. He puts it on the writing. He made sure that everything that was written communicated what he wanted to communicate. Peter's going to tell us that these things came to us by godly men who were moved by the Holy Spirit to write these things. That word moved is the same word we get in the Greek for the sail of a boat to be filled with wind that you can't see and move that ship on the course that it wants to go. It needs to go. That's why we can go to God's word and whatever it says, we can believe it to be so. And then we use God's word to judge what other people are saying. Then he says this, because all Scripture, given by the inspiration of God, all writing, God breathed, and it is a profitable for doctrine, for the dogma, the teaching of the church, so that we can understand theology, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That comes from the Word of God. I charge thee, therefore, now he moves right into the charge on Timothy because he knows he's leaving. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, who one day is going to judge the living and the dead. He's going to come again for the church and he's going to set up his kingdom. In light of that, you preach the word. You be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and what? Doctrine. Now, you can come in here to this church with a pet peeve. I don't care. But when we go through God's solid word and you are educated, those pet peeves got to go out the window. Can I get an amen? We build our lives on the solid foundation of God's word. We exeget the scripture. We don't eisegete it. You know the difference? Exegeting is just letting the scripture say what it says and let it confirm itself. Isogetting is when you come to the scripture with some idea that you have and you torture the text long enough to make it say what you want it to say. I have no interest in that. My interest is the same interest you have. I want to know what God says. You don't need to know what I say. I don't need to know what you say. We need to know what God has said. Amen? So this is what he's saying here. For the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. We're living in that time. Paul told us this time would come. But after their own lusts, because they want to hear it's okay to do things that the Bible doesn't give you permission to do. Do you know that? See, Jesus is not just, I just got done speaking to a couple who was having all kinds of trouble. Doesn't go to our church, lives in a different state. So don't look around. And I said, you don't have marriage problems, you have lordship problems. 
How so? Do you, are you being obedient as a husband to the things God's commanded you to do for your wife? But you don't know my wife. I said, listen, let me finish. You're too busy speaking and not hearing. I said, because when he gets to the wife, he's going to tell her to submit. But she submit to a godly leadership. And your job as a godly man is to go into her life, just like Christ came into ours. And if there's something wrong, you're to wash her in the water of the word. You have, listen guys, I'm going to tell you this morning, you have the wife that you made. Congratulations. No, congratulations. You have the very wife as the spiritual leader that you have made. I have people say, boy, if I had your wife, if I had call for a wife, then I could be a spiritual leader. I'm going to tell you, it didn't start out that way. Did not. <laughs> Jeff, it won't start out that way, brother. When you take on the responsibility of a wife, you take on the responsibility as a spiritual overseer. You're the pastor of your home. And you lead your family in the ways of God. You're not called to be the pal, you're called to be the parent. And you're called to train your child in the way they should go. I know that's, that's an aside, but let me finish this part out. For the time will come, they're not, but they shall heap for themselves lust, lustful thoughts. Teachers that will reiterate those lustful thoughts because they have itching ears. And they shall turn away from their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, mythos. Same thing Peter's going to use in a few moments. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of your ministry, Timothy. Peter would say, listen to this. We have a more sure word of prophecy where unto we do well to take heed as unto a light. Truth is light. It shines in the dark places. It exposes the darkness until the day dawns, until Jesus comes for us, until the day star arises in our hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. One of the things you'll note about false teachers, and Peter's going to remind us of this as we go through the rest of his epistle, is they think they have a special insight that nobody else has. And they'll say things, oh, yeah, 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 you go to Calvary Chapel and they study the Bible, but if you had our insight, if you get our tapes or read our books or, or study under our prophet, then, then you would grow up. Listen, you don't grow up if you grow beyond this. You grow out. You grow out. I've been studying this book. I've taught through the New Testament 17 times, whether in Bible college, men's studies, here at the church, 17 times through the New Testament. I think I'm on my sixth time through the Old Testament. And I'm still growing. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. God is still revealing himself to me. It's the unsearchable riches. You never grow out of it. You'll always be growing into it. And my job is just to stay a little bit ahead of you. But I haven't arrived either. I was studying something the other day, and I had to set my Bible down and say, how in the world did I not see that before? That is amazing. And I spent the rest of the day just meditating on it. Wow. And all the other scriptures were coming, connecting the dots. Lord, thank you. And I heard him come, this voice come from heaven to me in my heart saying, you ain't all that bright. <laughs> You're still learning. Why are you amazed that I can't still show you some? But Peter's saying we have a more sure word than our experiences. Let me move on because there's another verse I want to read and then we'll end. Of any, for the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God. They spake as they were moved. That's our word, the same, to, to, to fill the cells with wind. We're moved by the Holy Spirit. Did you know in Psalms 138 verse 2 that God said he honors his word above his name? That's how important his word is. But he says this, and we'll just read this, and I want to make one more commentary before we have uh, communion. But there were false prophets also. We're going through Jeremiah on Wednesday nights, and we see how many false prophets were prophesying peace and safety and, and, and all of these things when it wasn't coming. 
God's judgment was coming, and Jeremiah, a true prophet, along with Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah before them, were trying to warn the people. He says, as there were false prophets, prophets in the Old Testament, even so there shall be false teachers in the New Testament that will sneak in. They're stealthy. Jude says they creep in. They're creeps. They creep in unaware, and then they bring in damnable heresies. They bring in false teaching to the body of Christ, even denying the Lord that bought them, denying his lordship, saying that he said things he never said. That he gave permission to do things he never gave permission to do. That's what he says to Jeremiah. They're prophesying out of their own hearts. I never put those words in their mouth. They're not representing me. He said, this will be what happens in the last days. That will bring in these damnable heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways a departing from the biblical faith. Why is Peter warning us? And we'll stop there. We'll come back and we'll read one more verse. He's warning us because he says, in the last days, this is what's going to happen. Experience will supersede the word of God. And seducing spirits and doctrines, the demons will replace sound biblical doctrine. And many will follow those pernicious ways. He's warning us, don't be one of them. This is what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians. I just want to read it to you before he... Close our study tonight, and I tie a knot in it. In 2 Thessalonians, you don't have to turn there, they'll put it up on the screen. Chapter 2, starting in verse 7, it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, false teaching, corruption, lies of the wicked one, already at work. Only he now that letteth, old King James, new King James, he, he that resists will continue to resist until he's taken out of the way. Who might be the one resisting this false stuff? The true church. The salt and the light. Those that are building their lives on the solid foundation like Jesus said. You know, Jesus taught a parable about two men. One built his house on the sand and another on the rock. And the storms came to both of their lives. He said the guy that built his life upon the rock, the solid foundation of God's word, when the storm passed, he was still standing. But not so much for the one built his house on the sand. It was taken away. Then he says, Then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. If Satan can transform himself into an angel of lie, can't he perform false miracles? And if your faith is based upon what somebody can do, you can go to East India. We, we own two acres in Rapal. We have a orphanage there and five house churches. And our pastor there will tell you, Baju, that there are gurus there that can perform miracles. In fact, even the Old Testament said if a false prophet comes and he prophesies, and even what he prophesies comes to pass, but he doesn't attribute to God, stone him because he's a false prophet. We're living in a very dangerous time. Lying signs and wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because, listen carefully, because they receive not the love of the truth. That they might be saved. What is the safest place we could be? What is the safest foundation we could stand on? Experience or God's word? The Logos or the Rhema? You can't speak the Rhema until you know the Logos, the written word. And I see people running around all the same thing, thus saith the Lord. And I said, the Lord didn't say that. Well, how do you know? Because the Bible talks about something different than that. In fact, opposite of that. And then he says this. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion. These people are delusional. You talk to some of them and, and, and you can't convince them because they're delusional. He'll send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all may be damned who believed not the truth. They didn't have a love for the truth. They did not believe the truth but had pleasure and unrighteousness. Now notice the contrast here before we close this morning. But it's a it's a 
it's a contrastive term. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth. The belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the word in the old King James is tradition. Your new King James may say doctrine, and that's what it means. Hold firm to sound doctrine which you have been taught, whether in word or in epistle. So Peter is warning us being moved of the Holy Spirit to warn us. He said, listen, you need to understand something. You've been given divine power. You've been given exceeding great and precious promises. You've been given a divine nature. You are born again. Now add to that divine nature these things, that you might be profitable in all things. But you need to know this, and I will constantly remind you while I'm still in this tent before I move into my permanent house, I'm going to remind you that in the last days, people will be given over to experience. I had an experience. And it was a wonderful experience. And it was a true experience. But my life is not built on an experience. My life is built upon the solid foundation. We have a more sure word of prophecy. And I'll end by saying this, you will never outgrow the word because the word of God, first and foremost, is inerrant. And when I say inerrant, I mean in the original autographs. If there's a problem, it's always a language problem. You try to take it from the original language like Greek that is so more descriptive and you try to put it into English. And sometimes we don't have words. When I was teaching the pastors on Bavuma Island in Uganda a, a number of years ago, um, they did not have a word for diamond. Well, they had a word for diamond. They didn't have a word for pearl. Because we're talking about the pearl of great price, that, that because Jesus sold everything to come and redeem us, we were the pearl of great price. They didn't have a word for pearl. The interpreter looked at me and says, we have no word for that. I said, what do you mean you don't have a word for pearl? So we don't. I said, listen, this is called the Pearl of Africa. He said, the British named it that. We don't have a name for that. The closest we have for what you just said is a hole in the ground. And so I'm having a discussion with the interpreter while I'm training pastors. And I said, well, do you have a word for diamond? Oh, yes, we have a word for diamond. And so I said, well, then use that. So we have language problems, not original autograph problems. So the word of God is errant. It is inspired. God breathed. It is authoritative. It says what it means and means what it says. But here's the fourth thing, very important. It's written in a sixth grade level. This Bible is written in a sixth grade level. Did you know that? Because it's not complicated. It's not complicated. I like what our pastor Chuck used to say. If you could read it at a sixth grade level and you are born again of the Spirit, then the Spirit will lead and guide you into great truth. I'm just the donkey up here to say the words so the Holy Spirit can take them and put them into your heart. But we're living in that time. And Peter is warning us. Build your life on a sure foundation. A more sure foundation than experience. Because experience can lead you astray. When I think that I'm hearing God's voice, and I think I hear it often when I'm up praying. I measure it by the word of God. Because I don't want to be deceived. When Jesus was defending himself in the 40 year, 40 day, <laughs> might have seemed like 40 years, 40 year in the wilderness, what did he use? It is written. The sure foundation. Oh, do I love the presence of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth in my life? Do I love the gifts of the spirit? Do I not need discernment? Do we not need prophecy and interpretation? And Do we need those things today? Absolutely. But we have an enemy who wants to deceive us. So, 
Here it is. I promise this is the last verse in live communion. I promise. It's written on the wall when you walk out. That we are built upon a foundation. The apostles, New Testament, prophets, Old Testament, Jesus Christ himself being the thing that keeps everything square, the chief cornerstone. And that foundation is laid so that God might build his church on that foundation for a habitation of his Holy Spirit. Do we expect the Holy Spirit to move in this church? Absolutely. But can he move if we're not built upon a solid foundation? No, he cannot. Otherwise, we could be deceived. So Peter is warning us. Build your life on that. And let the Holy Spirit come and do his work. How many felt the Holy Spirit moving this morning? If you didn't, something's wrong with your string or something. I don't know. We, we pray for him to be here. But he will never go beyond the written word. Amen.